following is a GBN special presentation. Thank you, Brother Maxi. I love and appreciate uh, you and Fran so very much. Uh, so good to see all of you. I uh, appreciate the elders here, uh, the deacons, and all the teachers and the members and all of your uh, families. Uh, so good to be here. I also very much appreciate it, Brother Bob's uh, Stapleton's lesson. Uh, great gospel message, and also I appreciate him and his wife, Marsha, and the work that they do here in the School of Preaching. If you brought your Bibles, will you turn with me to Galatians chapter 1? Galatians chapter 1. And the text, you can read along with me, the text that I've been assigned is Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. The Bible says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be a curse. I was assigned this text, and this text, my subject that I was assigned was the one true gospel. Now, first of all, the one true gospel is a gospel of salvation. I know that because in chapter 1 here, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says that Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. And then Paul says in chapter 3 and verse number 1, he tells us how Christ gave himself, that Christ was evidently crucified among you. Now, you remember when Paul, uh, he talked about the gospel over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4, when he said, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. And then in verse 3 and verse 4, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he said in verse number 2, by which ye also are saved. You also are saved, not only by this, this is God's part, but there's another part to make the gospel complete that make it save. And that's what Jesus, I believe, what he was saying over in Luke 24, verse 46 to 47, when he commanded the great commission upon his apostles. He told them to go out and to preach two things, go preach God's part and preach man's part. God's part, he said in Luke 24, verse 46, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then also tell people about their part and that repentance and remission of sins shall be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you remember the disciples went out with the Great Commission in Acts chapter 2 uh, when they preached the first gospel message. How in verse number 14, Peter stood up with the 11. In verse number 22 to 24, he preached the death. They preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It said, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God raised up. And then he used Old Testament scriptures to show that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was prophesied. Psalm 16. Psalm 110, 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 132, verse 11. They concluded in verse number 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus, Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
And the Bible says, uh, the Jews that were assembled on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2 verse 5, when they heard these things, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They understood that they had a part. And then Peter also concurred. When he said to repent and be baptized, every one of you, none of you are excluded, every one of you in the name of or by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission, for the forgiveness of your sins and shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in verse 41 and 42, those that gladly received the word were baptized and they were added unto them 3,000 souls and they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And they were saved. Because the Bible says in verse 47, praising God and having faith with all the people the Lord added to the church daily such as be saved. Who did he add? He added those that obeyed. See, God had a part, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but man has a part to obey his uh, responsibility to that gospel. And back over in Galatians chapter 3, I think that's what Paul was talking about. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, that God's part, Christ, was crucified. But yet people have a part too. Christ, God's part, our obedience, man's part. In chapter 3 of Galatians, verse number 8, that Paul said in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel under Abraham, saying that, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed uh, through your descendants, especially one, specifically one. He was talking about all nations would be blessed through Jesus Christ. And that's what you see in verse 16. It says, and now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he said not unto seeds as of many, but as of one to thy seed, which is Christ. When God told Abraham that back in Genesis 22, he was talking about everyone or anyone is going to be spiritually blessed. It would only be through Jesus Christ. Now, it would be through Jesus Christ when we do what Abraham did. Back over in verse number 8, now, Paul is quoting from Genesis 22, verse 18. And this is what God told Abraham. He said that in, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. So, through belief in Jesus Christ, when we do our part to do like Abraham did, We'll be blessed like Abraham when we do like Abraham and we also obey. That's implied in the context. That's why in verse number 26, it says, You are all children by, of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You know, and biblical faith is that God said it, I believe it, and I obey. Real quickly, I just proved that in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, in verse number 7, it says, By faith, nor being warned of God of the things not seen as yet, God said it, moved with fear, he believed, and he prepared an ark to the saving of his house because God told him, so he obeyed. That's biblical faith. So back over in Galatians chapter 3, verse number 26, when the Bible says, see, here is our part, obedience, we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For many of, you, many of us have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. And there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. But you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That all nations will be blessed through Jesus Christ when we obey. God's part and man's part make the gospel complete and it will save. Now, you know also in that gospel message, uh, they not only believed and repented uh, and was baptized, but they also confessed. You remember in Acts chapter 8, when uh, Philip and the eunuch, uh, Philip preached unto him Jesus, and he uh, wanted to be baptized. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he made the great confession that I, in verse Acts 8, verse 37, that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then after that, 
Uh, him and uh, Philip and Eunice went down to the water and he baptized him. So I'm just trying to show you the whole complete gospel. And the one, uh, having been taught, told about the death, burden, and resurrection, resurre resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, they must believe, of course, repent, confess, which means to acknowledge Christ as the Son of God, and be baptized in water for the mission of their sins, and God adds them to the church what salvation is. That's all it is. <coughs> Excuse me, a little horse. Uh, I got a lot of kids, and I've been uh, fussing at the kids this week. But, <laughs> but that's all it is. It's just that simple. That's all. That's our we point right there. Now, it also includes, once we become Christians, about how we conduct ourselves. Because Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 27, to only let your conversation, King James word, your conduct, your manner of life, your behavior, be as becometh the gospel of Christ. And so we have to conduct ourselves the way the New Testament gospel teaches. If you look over in Galatians chapter 2, here's an example of it. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 14. When Paul said that when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. And what he was talking about was Peter and Barnabas and some other Jewish Christians, how they separated themselves from the Gentile Christians when some Jewish Christians came from the apostles. And if you see in verse number 13, at the end it says dissimulation. They were carried about by dissimulation or hypocrisy. So Paul said, when I saw that they walked not uprightly, they would not behave in the way the New Testament gospel says. Because they made a difference. And that's what the, uh, as I already said in Galatians 3 verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek nor bond of freedom, male nor freedom, you all one. And they were behaving like there was a difference. So what we have is uh, the New Testament gospel, the one true gospel, not only tells us how to be saved, it also tells us how to live, how to serve, and how to worship. It's only one of those. One way to be saved, one way to live, one way to serve, one way to worship for all of mankind. If you look back over in Galatians chapter 1, you can see the article in front of, started the article in front of gospel. In chapter 1 in verse number 7, the Bible says the gospel as of one. In verse 11, the gospel. In chapter 2, verse 5, the gospel. In chapter 2, verse 7, the gospel. In chapter 2, verse 14, the gospel. In chapter 3, verse 8, the gospel. In chapter 4, verse 13, the gospel, the gospel, one gospel. That's my lesson, one true gospel. Even back in chapter 1, if you notice in verse 11 and 12, Paul said, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it, singular tense, as of one, of man, neither was I taught it, one, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. It's only one gospel. When you got an it, you don't have a them, you only have one. I mean, I mean how complicated is it? If you look back also in chapter 1, verse 6, and verse 8, verse 6, you have another gospel. In verse number 8, you have any other gospel. Don't you know you have to have one to have another? You have to have one to have any other. Look with me in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the book in front of this book. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 4, Paul says, he said, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted. See, John says there is not another Jesus, there's only one. There's not another spirit, there's only one. There is not another gospel, there is only one. So when you say another, you're talking about a counterfeit. You're talking about a fake. It's not the real thing. 
Now, if you don't believe me, here's a little exercise you can do this week. Won't you go down to the local grocery store with another hundred dollar bill? And you just let, let them know, hey, this is not the, the hundred dollar bill that was issued by the United States Treasury Department, but it's another. And let us know and we'll uh, come visit you uh, at the local jail. The reason why they would not accept that is because another is not authorized. Just like another gospel is not authorized. You know, back over in Galatians chapter 1, as Brother Bob was saying, this was going on in this context. In Galatians chapter 1, in verse number 7, it's one true gospel. But there were some who were perverting the gospel. They were distorting the gospel. They were twisting the gospel, polluting the gospel. And they were doing that by uh, the one true gospel. They were adding to it Mosaic law and specifically, uh, more specifically, circumcision. Look with me in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Because you remember under Mosaic law, see, all the Jews, they were circumcised because that was a covenant that they had with God. Back in Leviticus chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. And now there were some Jewish Christians, uh, which are called Judaizing teachers, uh, that they were saying that the Gentile Christians, they need to be circumcised and also keep some other aspects of Mosaic law or they cannot be saved. And that's exactly what you see in chapter 15 and verse number 1. The Bible says, and certain men, these were Christian brethren that were Jews. And it says, which came down from Judea and taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Look at verse 5. It says, and there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed they were Christians, saying that it was needful to circumcise them, them, the Gentile Christians, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So anyway, this matter was, uh, was under consideration by the apostles and the elders and the brethren. In verse 7, Peter stands up and he says, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles about my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, two things. When Peter was preaching the gospel, the New Testament gospel, uh, to the Gentiles back in Acts chapter 10, you know, he was preaching the death, brother, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as he was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon the Gentile Christians. And Peter is saying, just as though, just as the Holy Spirit fell upon the Jewish, Jewish apostles, which represented all the Jews back in Acts chapter 2, it fell upon the Gentiles. And here's the thing. The Gentile, the Gentiles in Acts 10 were not circumcised when God gave them the Holy Spirit. In other words, it was saying that God approved of them without them being circumcised. And then also, you remember that uh, Peter told them how to be saved, just like the Jewish Christians that were circumcised, how they were saved. He told the uncircumcised Gentiles to be saved the same way. In Acts chapter 10, verse 47 and 48, Peter said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized who receive the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the point is, and they were baptized into Christ without being circumcised, without keeping any of the law of Moses. So in a way, here in Acts 15, in verse number 23, the apostles and the elders wrote letters to the Gentile brethren. And they said in verse 24, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. God didn't put that on you. We didn't put that up on you. You don't have to keep the law of Moses or be circumcised to be saved. 
Now, when you go back over to Galatians chapter 2, turn to Galatians chapter 2. And uh, I know some brethren um, are somewhat divided on this. Uh, some believe that Galatians chapter 2 goes with Acts chapter 11. And there are some brother, brethren who, may, who believe that uh, Galatians chapter 2 goes with Acts chapter 15. But nevertheless, you can see that the content or the subject matter is the same. In Galatians chapter 2, verse uh, 3 and 4, Paul said, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, other words brought in, who came in to privately uh, spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. He's talking about bring us back into the bondage of the old law. Because you know through Christ, Colossians 2 verse 14, that old law been nailed to the cross. That old law had been uh, abolished in Christ's flesh upon the, up on the cross, Ephesians 2 verse 15. So that's what Paul is talking about in Galatians. Look at chapter 5 in this book, chapter 5 and verse number 1. When he says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free, free from the burden of the old law, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage of the old law. Look at here. If you want to be circumcised, go be circumcised. But if you're going to be circumcised because you want to be saved according to the old law, he's going to say in verse number four, you have fallen from grace. Notice in chapter, chapter 5, verse 6 right here, that in, in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith in Christ. In chapter 6, in verse 15, in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 17. In Christ, 2 Timothy 2.10 is salvation without the old law. The ramifications or uh, the ordinances of the old law. So that's all we need. Now, let me tell you this. Just as what was going on uh, back then, there were some brethren who were adding uh, to the law, uh, adding to the gospel, the law of the Old Testament. It will add some things. And there's some who want to add some things and take some things away even today. And even though the Bible says throughout the whole Bible, the Bible says do not do that. Do not tamper with God's will. In Deuteronomy 4 verse 2, don't add or diminish from the word of God. Proverbs 30 verse 6, don't add to his words lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. Revelation 22 verse 18 and 19, don't add to his words. Don't take away from his words and yet folks still do it. You have religious people all across this fruited plain from sea to shining sea that are perverting God's word today. And even some of our brethren, they pervert the one true gospel too. People on TV, all through the media, telling folk that if you want to be saved, we'll just say the printer's, the sinner's prayer. They say, just, just pray to Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, they say, no, repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, come into my heart. Wash me from my sins, wash me from my sins, and, and make me yours, and make me yours. Now, if you said that prayer, thank God you're a Christian, and go find your good Bible church to be a member of. Where is that in the Bible at? Where did anyone in the, in the New Testament pray to God for pardon to become his child? No one ever did it, and no one was ever told that. See, somebody perverting the gospel. Where in the New Testament there was anyone told or anyone just accept the Lord as your personal Savior? You want to be saved? Just accept the Lord as your personal Savior and thank God you're a Christian. Where is that at? That's not in the Bible. We already said the belief, repentance, confession, and baptism put one in the Christ. That's what the New Testament teaches. And then likewise, we have some brethren that are following suit. I can speak about Dallas because I've been in Dallas a long time. We have some brethren over there telling, uh, telling good folk that you can take your pick of how to worship. 
You can worship contemporary, contemporarily, or you can have a traditional worship. It's up to you. But when we look at the New Testament, there's only one type of worship. Now, there's five activities of worship, and you can have those activities of whatever order you want, but you can't take any of them away, and you can't add to it. And over in Dallas, see that brother that are doing that. Some have added praise teams to the worship services. A praise team is nothing but a choir without robes. I said it. I said it is not right. I said it. I said it again. It's not right. All of God's folk are required to sing to him. God is the object of our worship, not one another. There's some, if you believe this, there's some brethren over in Dallas that have praise dancers, mostly women, that are dancing to instrumental, instrumental music that's being piped in over the loudspeakers. Praise dancers. You know, someone told me, they said, uh, well, David danced. I said, well, David wasn't in the New Testament church. David wasn't in New Testament worship. So when David danced over in 2 uh, Samuel chapter 6, verse 14, before the Ark of the Covenant, he was not in worship. And if he was in worship, he wouldn't authorize us to dance in worship today. And even in Dallas, in Dallas, Brother Max, I don't know what they're doing over here in Bedford, in Dallas, that they're spending the role of women. There are women in worship that are singing solos. Women serving communion on the communion table. Women uh, that are, are reading scripture. And there's even some congregations that have added the women to leadership roles in the church. When we read Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3, that the leadership of the church was performed by men, males, not females. And you know what? When you try to talk to those brothers, you say, well, hey, you know, the Bible only says one way. It's only one true gospel of how to be saved. One true gospel of how to live, how to worship, how to serve. Only one. And of course, they can't show you from the Bible. The Bible does say in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21 to prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And they just think they know. And they'll argue with you, but they can't show you scriptures. It kind of, and they remind me of Romans 1 verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Because it is foolish to tamper with the will and word of God. Tamper with his one true gospel. Many of them, they remind you of the two brothers in the church who were arguing about who knew the Bible the best. And they were just going back and forth about who knew it the best. And then finally, one said to the other, he said, I bet you $10 that you can't even recite the Lord's Prayer. And the other said, well, I'll take that bet. Then that shows you where they were spiritually if they're Christians and they're gambling. Because <laughs> Christians shouldn't gamble. I said it because it's covetousness and, and it's not good, good stewardship and it's a, it circumvents the work ethic and other things. But anyway, the other one said, I'll take that bet. So the other one said, well, go ahead and say it then. So he said, okay, and he began. He said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my Lord the soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And the other one just lowered his head and shook it. And he said, well, here's your money. I didn't think you could do it. And a lot of brethren like that, they're spiritually, they don't, they don't know their right hand from their left. And they just think they know. And when it's obvious to everyone else who has a Bible and using a Bible that they don't know, there's no scripture for that. Let me leave you with uh, four things before my time ends. Uh, back in Galatians chapter 1, turn to Galatians chapter 1. Let me tell you four things that happens when we pervert the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When, for, number one, when we pervert the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we do not have Christ. If you see in verse number uh, seven, at the end of verse seven, it is the gospel of Christ. At the end of verse number 12, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, that gospel came from Christ, it speaks of Christ, 
and it will unite you with Christ. But you know when you pervert it, or it may still speak of Christ. How many perverted gospels everywhere, and they still saying Jesus is Jesus that. But when you pervert it, it no longer has come from Christ, and it will not unite you with Christ. The Bible says in 2 John verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abided not in the doctrine of Christ had not God, but he that abided in the doctrine had both the Father and the Son. And even those that have obeyed the gospel, some of our brethren, and they are in the truth, in Christ, when they pervert the gospel and how to live and how to serve and how to worship, well, then they no longer have Christ because they didn't remain, didn't continue in the teaching. Uh, number two, when we pervert the gospel of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we no longer have the truth. You may have aspects of the truth, but you won't have the full truth. You will not have saving truth. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 5, you can see it is the truth of the gospel. In chapter 2, verse 14, the truth of the gospel. My Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21, that the truth is in Jesus Christ. There is no falsehood in Christ. And when the gospel is perverted, now someone, what they actually saying, there is falsehood, untruth in Christ. And you know, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 10, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they may be saved. If you pervert the truth, there's nothing else left but a lie. There's nothing else, no more truth uh, to save you. And when it comes to what folks say, Brother Eddie, when folks say, some brethren say, they say one thing, but God says something else. My Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 4, let God be true, let God be true and every man a liar. Uh, number three, when we pervert the, the one true gospel, we no longer have God's grace. Look at chapter 1 here and verse number 6. The Bible said we are call, it called you into the grace of Christ. But the Bible also says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14 that we are called by the gospel. And when we're called by the gospel, we're being called by his grace. That's what Paul called it over in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. He called it the gospel of God's grace. You know why? Because God was not obligated to provide it. And none of us have earned it. The gospel is his grace. And when we pervert the gospel, we no longer have his grace. And this, I'm tell you why it's important. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the first parts of that uh, scripture that says that the grace of God that bringeth salvation. God's grace brings salvation. So when we pervert the gospel, which is his grace, you no longer have salvation. And in the last reason, look with me in chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Verse 8, Paul said, though we, talking about the apostles, the apostles who were cherry-picked by Jesus Christ, the apostles who were apprentices of Jesus Christ, the apostles who were given the great commission by Jesus Christ, the apostles whom God or the Lord gave commandments through the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 2, who the Lord uh, sent the Holy Spirit will guide them in all truth. John 16 verse 13, he said, Though we, or an angel from heaven, an angelic being, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be a curse, as Brother uh, uh, Bob said. Let him be a curse, anathema, or fitted for destruction. And then he says in verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel than that ye have received, let him be a curse. See, the, the, the problem with preaching another gospel is, I, all four of those teach you're going to be lost because you cannot be saved without Christ. You cannot be saved without the saving truth. You cannot be saved without God's grace. And you cannot be saved because it explicitly says so in verse 8 and verse 9. You know, I'm going to tell you something equally bad. It's understanding the gospel and not complying with it. The Bible also teaches the person will be lost because of that also. 
Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9, Ye which are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flame and fire, taking vengeance on all them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of his, uh, the Lord and from the glorious power. Because someone understood and just looking for a more convenient time. I, I do it one day. I'm working on it. If we die in our sins, we're going to get up in our sins. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 2. Let me tell you something. When we leave the gospel alone, when we, we have it the way God gave it, and we embrace it, it's a wonderful thing. That's what Paul called the gospel in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 15. He called it glad tidings of good things. Because all of us can be saved eternally. We can become part of God's family and go to heaven and none of us deserve it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse number 20, there's not a just man upon the earth that do it good and sin it not. In Romans 3 verse 10, there are none righteous, no, not one. In Romans 3 verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And through God's love, he gave us the one true gospel of salvation that will save us from our sins, make us part of God's family, and give us a home in heaven through all eternity. Something none of us are worthy of, but I'll tell you something, we thank God for it. I want to encourage you today, if you have not obeyed God's gospel, do that today. Maybe you did something else. Somebody else told you something, but they can't show you that in Scripture. Put your faith in the Word of God. Do what he says. You can trust this. I can show somebody what I did. This is what I did to become a Christian right here. Because this is what God said, and I can trust God because God would do what he said he's going to do. God cannot lie, Titus 1, verse 16. It's impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6 and verse 18. He will do what he says and we have a home in heaven. Again, the gospel is God's love. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. Or Romans 5, verse 8, God committed love toward us. So while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, so God loved us, he sent his son. The son came into the world who suffered on the way to the cross and on the cross for our sins. And through our belief, I already said, through our belief, our repentance, our confession, our bapt baptism, water baptism, that's the only baptism that the apostles practiced, we can be saved. So in Acts 22, verse 16, Ananias told Paul, Why terrorist thou? Why are you waiting? But arise and be baptized and wash away his hands. And maybe a New Testament Christian and publicly you haven't lived the way you should, I'm going to encourage you to rededicate your life. Can I ask you, if you need to respond to an invitation, need prayers, please come while together we all stand and sing.